Dragon's Dogma 2. It's a good game. Not one that I can recommend. That's probably the best intro I can come up with. Now let's start with the, the negatives of this game. Because this game... Uh, man, it has got some hurdles that are difficult to overcome. So look, while I am enjoying this game and I'm going to keep playing this game... Um, there, it, as, as I said, it's not a game I can easily recommend because the negatives are so prominent. But if they are things you can overlook, then I do really think you're going to enjoy this game. So just like the first Dragon's Dogma, there is no fast travel. And let, let's be really clear about this. Yes, you've got fairy stones um, and they will take you to certain points on the map, but they're limited in number. You're never going to be flush with them. Uh, and it's just easier to have the mindset of, I've got to go everywhere on foot. Sure, you've got ox carts that can take you again to certain places at certain times of the day. But even with the ox carts, uh, there's no guarantee you can actually get to a place that you've paid good money to get to. Like, it, it, it's 50-50 whether or not there's going to be a group of bandits that stop you halfway through the journey or a monster that's just going to trash the car and in that case you're going to have to do the rest of the journey on foot. It's tedious and it's tiresome and when you take into account that the map is absolutely massive it is a very very real negative strike on this game. And what makes this worse is that every minute every three or four minutes at most you are going to be coming across either a group of goblins or a big old monster and on paper that sounds really fun that sounds really interesting and it is when you're doing it the first time but if you're just dropping off a letter and you have to stop every time you turn a corner it gets old real real fast there comes a time where you just want to get the mission done so you just run past everything and even then sometimes you can't run past the thing and you've got to engage in combat that you just can't be bothered with because you've done it i've fought the cyclops i've fought the griffin i have fought this particular band of goblins over and over and over and these damn harpies over and over and over again i did it five minutes ago i'm going to do it again in two minutes i just want to deliver the bloody letter and be done with it but i can't there is no way to skip it and it is tedious it is tiresome and it is poor gameplay mechanics now i will say that as you level up throughout this game uh, and your weapons become stronger uh, and maybe if you change your vocation a couple of times then it doesn't become as tedious um, as soon as i got to switch my vocation to the the magic archer yeah like it, it became a lot more bearable to do this stuff and it it became enjoyable to explore the world and much less punishing and that brings me into my next massive critique of this game the game wants you to explore it is very clear on this by the virtue of not having a fast travel system uh, that is in abundance it wants you to explore it wants you to seek out the caves and go down this route and then that route the game wants you to do this so as it wants you to do this why does it punish you for doing this particularly at lower levels but then again like if if you're anything other than the magic archer or one of these hybrid vocations um exploring the world is uh is not fun really it's it's not you are heavily reliant on your pawns on your party um and your pawns can be kind of dumb mine have pushed me off a cliff a few times um like i know there's a whole in-game thing where your pawn goes crazy and that's really interesting that's not what this is uh the pawns just just pushed me off a cliff because i don't know Maybe I insulted them when I didn't high-five them after we killed the same monster 50 times. 
the point is, exploring should be rewarded. But in this game, it rewards you with one hand and then slaps you with the other. If you're out at night, uh, or if you're out exploring during the day and then it turns into night, things get so much harder, it's so much harder to see ahead of you. Uh, and the monsters that come out at night are a whole different level. Which means you don't really want to be doing it. You want to find a nice place to camp, rest up for the night. And there is another problem with that. The carry weight system. Carry weight system in games is stupid. It has always been stupid. It will always be stupid. Don't give me that notion of, oh, but it's more realistic. Like, no, it's not. I've got a million reels of cheese on me and three swords. Like, that, that, it's. N I don't play video games for realism, is what I'm trying to get at here. I play video games for escapism. Nobody, nobody is picking up Dragon's Dogma 2 and going, God, you know what? This is going to be like a real, real, like, simulator type of game where I can get the real feel for that mythical world. So, of course, my carry weight is going to be limited. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that at all. And the camping kits... The basic ones that you'll come across are so heavy that it punishes you for having them. Then we've got the whole rest and eating system in the game. Now look, I, I'm going to go more into this in my Avatar game uh, review, but I do not like eating systems in a game. Like, you can have it as an optional extra, you know, like when you play Spider-Man 2 and you can have the map turned off and, and, and that stuff. Like, that's cool. Have it as an optional extra, and if I want to, I will dip into that. But don't have, don't force me to do it, especially when I've got to cook the stuff. And if I don't cook the stuff, then that's going to give me food poisoning. And if I don't eat, then eventually my, my health bar is going to go down to halfway and it's never going to get past halfway and the pawns are constantly moaning that oh they could really go for a bowl of stew right about now like that's not fun it's not fun to hear it's not fun management you know it's just it's it's irritating it's irritating this is slightly off on a tangent here but the reason why i didn't get days gone when it was released is because of the whole bike mechanic maintenance and uh, maintenance thing um, and the fact that a big deal was made out of hey you've really got to look after your bike now if, from what i've told the the bike maintenance was very different um at when when the game was released and they patched it and updated it and it was a lot more forgiving when i played the game it was a lot of fun and it never really felt like a burden but if it was a burden, I can guarantee I would not have finished playing that game. Because I don't play video games for burdens or for realism. Like, I love Dark Souls and Elden Ring. But you know what? Uh, that whole toxicity, that whole curse build-up. Like, I've, I've stopped playing Sekiro for a reason. And, like, I don't, I don't need a food system in my video games. Unless it's optional. Like in Skyrim, you can change your difficulties, add on your survival mode, do whatever. Like you, you, you play that type of game because that's the option you've got. But don't force me to have that in my game because it's just damn irritating and I've got shit to do. Finally, what I think is the last major drawback of this game is the lack of clarity for a lot of the missions. Now, this is 50-50. I quite enjoy the fact that the, your hand is not going to be held throughout the gameplay. I enjoy that, especially after playing games like Elden Ring, where they just give you the rough idea and here's the rough direction you need to go. I enjoy that. I think that, that shows putting a lot of... Uh, trust and faith in the in the player that being said there's been more than a few missions where I've had to uh, just Google or go on to YouTube and see how the hell you do this particular mission for a long 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 time I had my pawns yelling at me uh, that hey we need to go to the vocation 
Operation Guild thing store so we can unlock all of the vocations. Ah, oh, we've got this thing there. So I go there every single time and no. Apparently I don't have a great sword despite the entire game telling me that I do. It is monumentally frustrating. Now I know Ghost Recon is a very different type of game. But Ghost Recon lets you do something that is fantastic. It lets you tailor uh, how much things are sort of handed to you and how much things are held for you. Like if you want to do a little bit of digging, you can do that little bit of digging. If you want the little extra work of going through the map and trying to find the place, it gives you that option. Uh, or if you just want a, a, a marker on the map, say, hey, dipshit, go here and talk to this person then you can do that and I appreciate that and I think that should have been something that was put into Dragon's Dogma rather than the default of uh, do the thing but we're not going to tell you how to do the thing for half of the time it is it's frustrating but it's probably the least frustrating part of the game and honestly these are the biggest negatives that I can see and honestly that whole lack of fast travel is the biggest by far i i can't i can't express to you how much of a cripple that will be uh for this game because it is a big old game it is a big old map and going from one place to the other back and forth 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 it, it's tedious it's tiresome it's not fun it's not enjoyable there's no new challenges uh, the porn banter or the porn conversation is not that in depth. It's not that amazing. Like, there's only so many times I can hear. As a matter of fact, one of my previous masters only sought to employ women. I wonder why. Yeah, like, we know why. We know. Come on. We know. But the point is. It is a big, big drawback of this game, and I wish that it wasn't. Even if you could only fast travel to uh, a, a set number of places, um, but you could do that at any point, um, as long as you weren't in combat, then like that would be a big redeeming feature, and I don't think it would be uh, anything to worry about. Then it would be a game that I could recommend to everyone, but it's not so I can't and it is a big deal with a map this big because those fairy stones like they're expensive and you never really have a whole lot of them at any one time especially in the first few hours of the game it's like they are limited gold is more common than these things are and I'm currently like past the 20 hour mark and I think I've got like three in storage and I'm reluctant to use them because I don't know when I'm going to be able to pick up replacements. But, now hear me out. If you can make it past these big critiques, then Dragon's Dogma 2 is genuinely a fantastic game. The, the variation of combat is absolutely fantastic it is so enjoyable as i said i have now become the magic archer and i am loving it absolutely loving it the various vocations which you know your classes that you can go through and that you can set your own pawn that you make uh, of what they can do during the game these things are genuinely enjoyable and it means that you can switch vocation from the, the magic archer to having a spear, to having a sword, to being the traditional archer, to being the thief, to being the mage. And it has to change how you play the game and it's so much fun. The story itself is nothing really to write home about. Uh, you are the Arisen. This basically means you should be the monarch of the of the country, but uh, there's an imposer, an imposter, ah, and big things. It it's a fine story. It's a fine story. The what I find really really great about this game is the side quests, and the fact that they are a bit taxing. You can't just pick up side quests willy nilly. 
Like you've got to see a lot of them through to completion. One of the side quests I had to Google, uh, had to go to YouTube about um, is, is one where you try to find some young lad who got dragged off by the wolves. Um, I left it a few days because I couldn't be bothered. Um, turns out, yeah, I should have. Uh, he's uh, he's gone. He's he's gone. He's gone. Uh, like I can't start another character and save the lad because uh, well, that would delete all my save progress so far, uh, and I'm not doing that. So uh, there's consequences for this game. There's consequences if you choose not to uh, follow the path of uh, another uh, kid in the game who's trying to collect something for his mum, uh, the kid's gonna die. Uh, like, like there's nothing that comes up that says, hey, you should probably follow this kid to the village. Um, and, and there's no dialogue options that, that say, hey, kid, look, we'll or you and, and everything else. No, no, you, you, you've really got to do that on your own back. Um, otherwise, the kid's gonna die. That's, that's how that would end. Um, and I really like that. I really like the fact that the game doesn't stop because you do. I like the fact that the game keeps on going even though that is slightly to the detriment because uh, as I've said before this game does have an eating system uh, and your food's gonna rot uh, in your inventory. Like like when I go back to playing the game um, there'll be berries, there'll be meat that would have spoiled and gone rotten that I can't eat because then that, 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 will, that will poison me. Um, so that's a that's a kick between the legs, but I like the fact that the game exists regardless of you being in it, as opposed to a game like against Skyrim, where the game sort of stops until you're there, like nothing happens until you're there, um, and then you can take as long uh, as you want to do the, the the side quests or the main quests. Like there's no real consequences for that. Whereas in this game. They make it very clear that things are going to happen whether or not you want to be a part of them. And I, I like that. I like the fact that the world feels as if it's living and breathing. Now, obviously, this is a very beautiful game. You sort of expect that uh, in, in 2024. Um, you sort of expect these, these, these beautiful uh, visions of the countryside and of cities. Uh, and it really is something to behold because they've done something that is fairly rare when you break things down. They've given believable cities. Like the only things that really spring to mind when I think of uh, breathable uh, cities that, that actually have that life to them are really kind of limited you've you've got uh the cities from witcher 3 um cyberpunk so you know cd project red um games uh, and then maybe gta and uh mafia mafia 3 possibly uh but apart from that you know it's it's not really easy to to point out a game that says oh yeah that that city i definitely believe that that city exists without me having to interact with it so that is definitely a plus side of the whole time moves regardless of you being there or not. And as I said, the game does want you to explore. The game is going to reward you if you do go exploring. It will tell you secrets. It will give you these, these different monsters to fight. Uh, even if sometimes you're fighting one monster and then another will just land right on top of your head and that will end the game. That's... That, that's frustrating, that's, um, I'm not gonna lie, that, that's made me tap out a few times. Most games in this type of genre give you that power fantasy where you are practically a god in the world. You know, you, you look at, again, Skyrim, you are the Dragonborn. Uh, you look at Oblivion, you are the hero of Kavach, and you later become Sheagorath himself. Like, these games are really good for giving you that, that power trip. Like, there's nothing that can beat you. And even with like games like uh, Dark Souls and Bloodborne and Elden Ring, uh, you can still get to that point, even though, if you're not paying attention, the lower level enemies can absolutely demolish you. But the point is, 
it builds you towards that level of greatness and Dragon's Dogma is somewhere in between Elden Ring and Skyrim on, on that bell curve. It's somewhere between punishing you mercilessly and uh, holding your hand to greatness. It's a great balance. I just, I just wish it wasn't so tedious. Now look, with everything being said, is this game of the year material? No, no, not at all. Most people are not going to like this game. They just, they just aren't. This isn't going to be a game for everyone. This is a relatively niche audience. And yes, I do like the game. I'm going to play this game for years to come. It's going to be like uh, Dark Souls or Bloodborne, a game that I just keep going back to. But it's not a game I can recommend because of the established drawback. It's a bit like foldable phone, right? So I, I've had a foldable phone since they first came out, Z Flip 1. My, my first foldable phone, I've tried numerous ones. I love foldable phones, but I can't recommend it. The, the, the best one I could recommend right now is the Google Pixel Fold, which is the phone I'm using right now. But even then, like, I can only recommend this because I know that most people would be able to use this phone without having to open it up, which sort of defeats the purpose of, of a foldable phone, really, doesn't it? But much like I really like this game, it's not a game I can recommend to my friends because, shit, this game wants to waste your time. And this is before we touch into the whole controversy with the DLC bullshit, which, let's talk, let, let, let's talk about that. Right, let, let's talk about the DLC bullshit. And it is bullshit. So, as I said beforehand, uh, if you want to fast travel, you need fairy stones. Now, you can buy fairy stones with real world money on top of buying this game with real world money. And that makes it a little bit easier, but you don't have to. Technically, nothing that you uh, would be able to buy on the DLC, you have to buy because it's all sort of stuff you can get early on in the game or relatively early on in the game. But that doesn't make it better and that doesn't give it a free pass. In my opinion, it just makes things worse because the higher ups who are in charge of this stuff, not necessarily the devs, but the higher ups knew that this would be a tedious, irritating feature of the game. So if you pay more money, then we can mitigate some of that tediousness. That doesn't make it better. That makes it predatory and shit. If you're going to want to have people explore this world, have people explore this world, but give them the means within the game. This game is not free. Like, I will drop money on Warframe because it's a free-to-play game. And I don't mind. This is a full-price game. And games have gotten more and more expensive as the years have gone past. With very little justification as to why. Yes, inflation is a thing, but... Uh, why do you get 70 quid? Fuck off. So to wrap this all up, yes, it's a good game. What this game does right, it really does well. Really, really does well. It is a fantastic, fantastic game. But if you are the type of person who is going to be put off by long treks, this game is not for you. And that's absolutely fine. You can watch someone play this game for you. It's going to cut out all of that bullshit. If you're the type of person that wants to go more than five seconds with all having to fight things just to get a simple quest done this game is not going to be for you and that's fine it, it's absolutely fine because you know we've still got other games out there but if you do like that if you do like the combat if you do want to fully immerse yourself in this world yeah it's definitely worth checking Thanks for watching guys, till next time, stay safe.